Welcome back to Reimagine 2021 version 11, our virtual conference series, bringing you nothing but the best projects, bright minds, and leaders in the space. My name is Miguel Vasquez, and with us now is Josh Greenwald, Chief Risk Officer at Uphold, the Anything to Anything trade platform. They've recently announced a partnership with Mythical Marketplace in their goal to bring efficiency to cryptocurrency and crypto retail. Josh, I heard this is more than uh, just sponsoring some NFTs. Is, is that correct? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, that you know, like Mythical is one of, I think lots of people have wanted to, uh, you know, get into gaming and get into NFT marketplaces. And it's really great to see a company that's gaming native kind of open up a platform for NFTs in the space. Um, we've seen a lot of guys move from crypto into the space, but Mythical is kind of unique coming from like that gaming DNA and coming into the marketplace. Um, so we're really excited to do a whole bunch of things with them. Um, I think a lot of times like our our partnerships start kind of on the boring side where we're the regulated payments gateway to get money, you know, from from the traditional world into the crypto world, but we'll start there and, and, and see how things develop. Well, let's talk a little bit about like what Uphold actually does in case people don't actually fully understand. Then we can maybe talk about actually how y'all are um, in with the actual mythical marketplace stuff. So let's talk a little bit about that anything to anything marketplace that that Uphold has. Sure. Um, I think that that Uphold, like zooming really far out, you know, like we we are a, 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 a crypto brokerage. We're a market maker in a large number of digital assets, foreign exchange, equities, and metals. Um, I think that, you know, like we really, we really hammer internally on this slogan of anything to anything for anyone, anywhere. Um, and that really speaks to the fact that like we're a global platform. We have, you know, more than a million users on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and I think that like the thing that that like gets me fired up about what we do is I think about all of the I think about like the fact that like we've grown up in this world where uh, you know there's like multiple platforms to trade multiple different types of assets and multiple types of middle middlemen need to get paid. <laughs> and and like uh, and and like that is not just like a waste of all of our time and our resources, but like it, it's totally unnecessary in a digital world. Um, it's probably been unnecessary without blockchain, and it's particularly unnecessary with blockchain. So that's that's kind of what we're what we're like really fired up to try and help help solve. And you know, today there's I think 66 digital assets and, and 50 equities and 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 you know a few metals and and 30ish FX, but um, I think that in the next few years, Uphold would be a platform with tens of thousands of assets. Um, and, and, you know, like, I imagine that, that in a distant future, that could be, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of assets, especially when you think about NFTs and all of the sort of like myriad of content, financial content that, that people want to plug into and they don't want to, you know, use multiple apps. And have their money kind of spread about multiple places. So that, that's that's kind of like what Uphold really is trying to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, we, we, we can we can <laughs> jump in any particular spot there. Actually. Yeah, definitely. I think it's an interesting time that we we live in right now, right? Where you're seeing that kind of blossoming of all these different kinds of assets that people. It's for lack of a better way to describe it, kind of almost a barter type return to barter kind of thing. Maybe you could talk about some of the, the risks that you manage um, in terms of swapping from even something like a security to crypto or some of the more esoteric stuff that y'all do. Yeah, I mean, I think that that definitely is a challenge to be a market maker in all of these assets, um, especially since a lot of them don't trade 24 seven, 365 like crypto. Um, but we provide liquidity in them as if they do. So you know you can you can show up at two a.m. on a Saturday night and trade Tesla stock with us and swap it for Ethereum, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll match that trade with you. And if you want to do it uh, into silver two hours later at four a.m., even though there's no metal markets open, we'll do that as well. I think that that's you know that's powered really by just kind of uh, the the core market making team has been 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 in financial markets for a long time. We got risk models and statistical models to sort of price where we think things, the fair value of things are. And we, we sort of um, do our best to make sure that we're providing liquidity in that stuff all the time. 
So um, just to kind of break it down a little bit, a little bit more uh, granularly, right? When somebody comes and says, okay, I've got this Ethereum and I, I want to, you know, swap it into Tesla. How does that actually take place like at 2 a.m. in the morning? So in, in part of that, part like basically when, whenever a customer requests a trade with us on Optical, um, they're like, they're done and filled immediately. So, you know, like every quote that we show a customer we're held to for I think 36 seconds. So if we show you a price, you got 36 seconds to say yes or no on that price. Um, and really like once you click submit and confirm the trade, you're filled and it's on us to manage our risk. Like we owe you the, we owe you the Tesla and, and, and you know, like we, we now have Ethereum that we received in order for us to go source our obligation on Tesla. Um, and what we have to do sort of is wear that Tesla risk for a few hours until the market reopens and then we can go source Tesla on the market. But any sort of, you know, market movement adverse, if, if, if Tesla moves against us, that's, that's sort of our, our trading loss and then your trading gain. Uh, when, when that happens and you know like um and, and certainly it's not it's not really like i think that it's it's most obvious that challenge you know like when you've got markets that are closed or um you know like weekends and stuff like that but i think everyone that's a market maker in these assets is sort of always um wearing that risk one way or the other as a as a liquidity provider you know like crypto is can be super volatile uh you know like a the, the, you know, like a lot of the systems have like, you know, like all kinds of safeties, like risk safeties and trading safeties that you build in any sort of, you know, trading system that, that sort of is the engine that backs a lot of uphold. And, you know, like I, I came from traditional markets. And so I had like all these, you know, opinions of like, what a reasonable price band is like, okay, like this thing's not gonna move more than 30% in a day. And I'm like, okay, fine. Yeah, it could. <laughs> it's not gonna move 30% <laughs> in an hour. Oh, okay, yeah, it could. like everything <laughs> is possible in crypto. Um, every unusual thing that could happen in markets, you'll probably run into, especially when you cover the sort of broad spectrum of assets that we cover. And you, know, you, you talk about like people going from Ethereum to Tesla or gold to some other crypto, you know, like those sorts of cross asset trades are a small percentage of what we do. Like, like they definitely are a meaningful percentage, but particularly crypto to crypto trades are a, are a big part of the business. You know, I think the numbers float around, but you know, somewhere north of 50 to 55 percent of all trades on the platform are don't involve a fiat currency, like aren't just dollars to Bitcoin or Ethereum to Euro. So it, it, it does speak to like the, the, you know, at least for our user base, people do really sort of like being able to go from anything to anything. They don't want to have to hop back to dollars or euros or whatever pounds, whatever their local currency is to do a trade. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's more of kind of that forex kind of mindset. For I, I don't really know how how else to describe it. And when you when you say um, that there's a large crypto to crypto jumping, is that because um, uh, on Uphold, I, I read that that y'all take on assets that other crypto assets specifically that others won't, like um, XRP or Helium, things of that nature. And how do you how do y'all um, stomach that? Well, I mean, I think that that everyone sort of takes, well, not everyone, but most most of the people, most of our peer group takes a kind of like risk based approach for how they handle listings. Um, and, you know, like we have we have kind of like this multi step listing process where we have like a working group that discusses kind of like some like high level diligence on projects. And then we have like a listing committee that sort of assimilates like a more thorough you know, dossier on all the diligence we can possibly collect on something. And a, and a big part of that analysis is, you know, assessing um, whether or not relevant regulators will find something to be a security, right? Like that's, that's a big part. Um, and, you know, like XRP is kind of a, a, a long, well, probably it's too long of a story to go to get into all of the, all of the details of, of XRP. But, you know, we, you know, like we spoke to our council who was sort of deeply you know, deeply knowledgeable on, on the XRP case. And I think that where we got to is, you know, there, there was, you know, there was a case against, against Ripple for actions that happened in the past about, you know, XRP being sold as a security in the past. And we had to weigh the risks of being wrong, you know, the risks of it being deemed a security today with kind of like 
the risks that delisting would do significant damage to our customers. Um, and so, you know, there, there is no, there is no like riskless approach to a situation like XRP. You're either going to hurt your customers to potentially satisfy a, regu a regulatory claim, or you're going to, you know, play it safe and satisfy the regulatory claim, but maybe your customers lose, you know, a huge percentage having to exit, you know, these positions. And so that, that's kind of how we ended up on the, and that's kind of a part of the decision process that went into XRP. And then that similarly informs how, how we, how we pick and choose listings. Um, like we, I'd say like we take a more conservative approach along some axes than, than some of our competitors. Um, but it, it's kind of like, I think everyone has like the things that, that scare them the most in terms of like where, where they think the regulators are coming down on. And, and it's, you know, like we, we don't, you'll notice like there's no privacy coins on, on Uphold. That, that was um, going to be my next question. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that we don't like privacy coins. Like I, you know, like I, I like Zcash. I, I think that like what, you know, I think that like a lot of, especially like, you know, I have enormous respect for Zuko and, and like the technology of Zcash is amazing. And like so many, so many other crypto projects have taken inspiration from the work that he's done. Um, and, you know, like, like, you know, like zero knowledge proofs like really, really come from 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 the work of Zcash. So I think that like, but but we we see it as kind of like a, a like too large of a risk to underlie underwrite. Not not even just because of of you know like what a particular regulatory body will do. But when you live in kind of like the regulated world where you spend where where one half of Uphold's foot is in in this sort of like traditional finance. You know, we have partners. We have, you know, we work with banks and, and, you know, all kinds of other guys who sometimes have a more conservative approach to some of the stuff. And so we have to sort of find that balance and sort of which risks do we underwrite in the listing process and which ones we don't. And is it fair to say that if a market was going to be big enough, right, sometimes those risks don't even have to be very, very big um, in terms of judging them uh, because the damages get much, much larger am I, am I correct in assuming it for sure i mean and and, and on the like the same is true sort of like on the flip side like if an asset doesn't trade very much and it's like a very small asset and there's not that much opportunity in it then it's also sort of like the like to take marginal risk with the listing is, is also tough and, and you know like we don't have official policies it, we don't even really have unofficial policies on sort of on, on sort of like the the scale of trading volume or some such that, that we need to see to consider a listing. It's definitely a factor in the decision-making, but, you know, I think it's a factor. I think that like users should understand it, that like for all platforms, that's sort of a factor in the decision process of listings because you, you are underwriting risk to, to list more and more assets. Um, not, not just regulatory risk. I mean, there's also just like the more stuff you have on the platform, if you're a market maker like us, like the more things you have to price, the more, more things can go wrong. Um, and so, you know, it, like, it's just, it's just part of like that kind of like giant matrix that, that informs whether or not we, we think an asset is, is suitable to, for, for listing today. Um, and then the other, the other part is that, you know, you, um, like crypto is, is, is like, it's, it's so, it's so hyper cyclical and moves so fast. And so if you, if you are trying to like chase what is hot right now in terms of asset support, I mean, you can do it. And, and there certainly are some platforms that do a really good job of like, of like, just like, they just nail like, what is like, what is like the sentiment? They, they get it out the door really fast. That's not really what we do. Um, what we're, like, I think that what we try to do is like, we look for, um, we look for like communities and ecosystems that, that we think can be like long-term good partners for us. Um, you know, like we, we sort of, we talk internally about like this idea that like ecosystems and communities are, are like increasingly the organizational structures of the world. Um, and, you know, like we, we, we were really early in listing Dogecoin. Um, you know, like Dogecoin was always like this, like, like to us, like, you know, like it's a, it's an, it was an enormous Reddit community had like this great culture of, of people just like really amused by kind of like like the the kind of like arbitrariness of the of the Bitcoin forks. You know, like there's Bitcoin 
And it's like kind of like this pure thing. But then, you know, like you've got Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash and a bajillion other clones of Bitcoin. And it's a little bit arbitrary. Why, why like Dogecoin is a joke and those are not, and those are more serious. And, and, and I think that the market sort of, you know, bore that out, which is like, yeah, you know, like, you know, Bitcoin is great. Um, but for, for a few years there, like it was really congested and really expensive to use. And you needed these other, you needed these other, you know, like forks if you really wanted to quickly, cheaply move money around. That, that was a slightly different world. Now we live in the world of stable coin and Ethereum is really dominated. But, but that, that was kind of what informed to a large degree our, our, our desire to like get involved with Doge. I think we listed Doge. I mean, I attempted to say like late 2019. Um, long before the Elon Musk days. I mean, it's just, it's so interesting because um, it really is kind of that fragmented, how much is a joke worth really, right? And I guess it's worth, you know, uh, under a dollar, but I mean, hey, that's pretty good. I saw, I saw you say to achieve wider adoption of cryptocurrencies, uh, you want prices to go up, but volatility to go down. So how can some of these communities you know, help adopt that? Is it just, you know, the HODL meme that everybody talks about? Yeah, I think that, that that's, that's definitely something that that's, that's going to take quite some time still. Um, because, you know, I mean, even, you know, like, it's probably gonna, it's probably gonna happen from on high, you know, like, as, as volatility comes out of Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, like, volatility will start coming out of the next tier of, of major market assets, um, you know, like we've, we've seen, you know, like a pretty high vol regime ever since, I guess, ever since really like, you know, Black Thursday and then, and then into kind of COVID. And it's, it's been, you know, I, I remember the days when implied volatility in Ethereum and Bitcoin was in the 30 and 40% range. And, you know, like we've had nearly a year and a half of, you know, 80 to 100% volatility in those assets. Um, you know, my, my, I, I would think that you know, the major things that are going to make a difference there are like things that are probably like kind of boring to everyone, which is like ETFs and, you know, more developed, more active futures markets and traditional markets and stuff like that. Like more just kind of like big institutional money where the stuff just kind of sits on books and balance sheet and isn't moving around as much. And so like there's just a, a larger amount of the assets parked and people are willing to hold. Um, but yeah, like that, that's not going to trickle down to Doge and Shiba very quickly. Like those things are going to be super volatile for, for forever, um, uh, or certainly for a long time. But there's been, we, we have, uh, seen some, some movement on that, um, here just recently with that stable coin paper that just came out. Um, and I did say, I did hear, see that you kind of were talking about the ETFs previously. Is there... I know that there's a, a recently the ProShares ETF was announced. Has there been any sort of other kind of regulatory framework for how that gets done? Or is it just kind of like chuck one up and hope it goes in? Well, I think that, I mean, I, I haven't had my ear to the ground too closely on the ETF. I mean, I saw that there was like the 1.25X uh, ETF that was proposed. And, you know, like the speculation I saw was that that was likely to pass. So like all of these like futures-based product, products, seem like they're they're likely to eventually make make their way to market um there definitely is some like amusing stuff with that like where where like you can potentially run into contract limits on the cme and stuff like that where i, I don't know what like then they become like delevered because they have to hold they're like fractionally cash and fractionally bitcoin there's, there's definitely like challenges to that to that sort of model um i i think that you know um i, I think i think that like the etfs are they, they're, in, in some ways they're like a little bit disappointing. Um, like, because, because like in a, in a perfect world, like you, you don't really need ETFs. Like it should be so easy to buy and hold Bitcoin on your, on your broke in your brokerage account where it would be kind of like, why should I pay these fees again to middlemen to, 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 to buy Bitcoin? Like I can just buy Bitcoin. Like, um, but I think that we, we haven't quite made crypto accessible enough and easy enough for all the different market participants to function that way. And so ETFs are kind of a necessary evil for types of market participants to, to be in the, in the space and to get exposure. So for that, like, you know, for all of those reasons, like very happy with, with, with finally seeing progress on ETFs, but um, it, it, it is like, 
it, it in some ways feels like a little bit of a step backwards from from like the, the benefits of Bitcoin. <laughs> Well, it's almost kind of like you need to ask your dad for like 50 bucks to go out for the weekend or something, you know, that kind of, what about things like credit cards? Um, can like, uh, I know Uphold has a credit card. I've seen a couple of other, I in fact have a number of them, even for some that I don't even have that much on. Is that something that can also broaden the adoption of um, uh, cryptocurrency? And what, how, how does that function as an effective little man? Yeah, I mean, I think that like the debit card is, is it's like critical for our strategy. I, I think that like lots of lots of platforms have cards. Um, I think one of the things that's pretty unique about our card is that you don't have to like pre-fill it up. Um, like a bunch of the debit cards, you have to like you can hold crypto in a wallet, but then you have to convert it to dollars or euros to preload the card. Um, and they're like kind of like prepaid cards. Um, in that model, like ours, like you know, if you want to spend XRP, you select XRP. If you want to select, if you want to spend basic attention token, like you select it in the app and you're spending it, you know, like on the fly. You don't have to like fill a bucket up with with cash first. Um, I think that you know, it's not, you know, there there are, there are challenges with spending crypto, especially like, you know, for an American, like the tax implications of like spending crypto is kind of a nightmare on a card. And and I I really hope that we 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 get out like something that there's, I, I pray for some, for some like, you know, some regulatory change where you don't have to like track a capital sale for a $2 coffee, well, probably a $5 coffee these days, but um, like, you know, like it, it's sort of, it's so ridiculous. Like it's, it's like, I'm not, I'm not trading. I'm just buying coffee and really I, I, whether or not that, that the Bitcoin were higher or lower on that purchase shouldn't matter. And so that, that that's definitely like, Part of the 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 that the, the, that creates more difficulty for card adoption for crypto cards, but ultimately, you know, there's a few things that that are that are critical for cards. Like one, you know, um, it, it makes it makes crypto real. Like you can use it in the real world. I think a big part of like what Upload wants to do is is find like real world use cases for cryptocurrency, um, not not beyond just pure speculation. And, and a debit card really, really powers that. Most people do things in their real life um, with, with crypto. And so it's, it's going back the other direction across the bridge. Um, for those of us that, that grew up, you know, in, that live in, you know, in, in the US or, or Europe, um, you know, like where it's easy to get access to the banking system, it's not, it's not as necessary. It's still nice, maybe. It's like a convenience to have a debit card that's linked to your crypto. Um, but if you're a freelancer and you don't want to use your local banking system, but you know you can run around and use a MasterCard in your life, having a debit card is really kind of magic. You can get paid as a freelancer in Bitcoin or whatever your preferred crypto is, and you can go live your life and pay your bills with your MasterCard, and you don't need to rely on, on potentially a cumbersome local banking system. And I think that like, that's not the like fanciest, sexiest DeFi solution to all problems that like we sort of, we want to get to, but like from a practical perspective, it's really powerful. And so that's, that's kind of like what the debit card means to us, like why we decided to, to, you know, like opt like, you know, acquire Optimus who powers our program and why we sort of, you, you hear us talk about the debit card like a lot in Uphold. It really is kind of like the way that we anchor all of the kind of intangible things that we're out doing in crypto into like real world application. Very, 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 very interesting, especially because it does, it, that is the primary use case that I've heard from these um, credit cards is that it cuts through that regulatory red tape that sometimes the a border of a country or, you know, a different, even sometimes a different bank um, you know, it's it's a nightmare. And then in the global south, um, these things are because we do take it for, uh, you know, in, in America, we do take it for granted, just, you know, access to a banking system. How do you think um, the the developments in El Salvador, the Chivo wallet, um, we were talking about uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin forks earlier. It's kind of funny that that lightning um, network premiered right as El Salvador was like, hey, we want to make it. A, uh, a currency. What do you think about that in terms of heading into the future? And then also IMF, um, 
uh, they labeled cryptoization as a threat. Is that just you know internal IMF politics? Uh, you could talk. About I mean, that. I think I think that like there's there's like so many intersecting narratives, and it's like um, you've got like this great narrative for Bitcoin with kind of you know like pr probably not hyperinflation, but significant inflation in the developing world, and and even more inflation. Or sorry, this significant inflation in the developed world, and and even more inflation in the developing world. And so there's this like, you know, real flight to flight to non-inflation, non-inflationary assets. And so there's this great narrative for Bitcoin and the idea of like, you know, uh, people turning like 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 smaller nations turning their back on the dollar because the 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 credibility of the dollar has been weakened a little bit by sort of our unwillingness to to you know like stop the to stop the printers. <laughs> um, uh, I think that like the the all of the um, I, I think that there's like the the that combined with like the the insane growth in stablecoin use is creating a situation where you know a lot of money is moving around in crypto now and it's kind of undeniable that that at times crypto is way easier to use than the traditional system. Um, not always. And it's like, it's like this really kind of piecemeal thing, you know, like sometimes you're like, you know, like on, on a, some days I'm in love with crypto. Um, and, and, you know, like, you know, like if I want to, if I want to move money from an LLC to, uh, to a, you know, like, you know, if I want to invest from an investment club to some new opportunity, you know, I can move USDC immediately. I don't need to ask anyone's permission. It's, it's like the easiest thing in the world. Um, to do and it's it's great it's magic and then but at the same time you know you realize that like well like but ethereum fees can be you know 50 100 bucks to do a transaction and you know like that's not exactly competitive with 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 swiping a card you know like your mastercard is it's pretty cheap relatively um and so i think that the the backdrop is like you know like you've got all this adoption to uh to these other payment methods and you can't like you like the narrative that like blockchain is too slow it's too expensive it's not gonna be competitive like that that narrative doesn't really hold as much weight when you when you've seen that we're up to like i don't know 200 billion dollars in stable coins now or wherever we're getting close to that um and and you know the amount of usage on these networks is really like you know like exploding like it's you know it's, it's crashing higher you know, like metamask was at 20 million monthly actives i think last month like it's it's really the adoption curve has really, really started to pick up. And so I think that everyone is looking now at the space, all, all, all sort of regulars looking at the space with a more critical eye on like, what risks are people underwriting participating in these, in these you know, ecosystems? And is there a systemic or existential risk um, due to that participation? So, to alleviate some of this risk, sometimes um, you see that word thrown around um, DAO, that uh, distributed autonomous organization. Um, what kind of role can that play in, I guess, diversifying risk? And do you see any sort of future for that in a regulatory environment or even moving away from a regulatory environment? I think DAOs are sort of like the one of the most interesting developments in the past kind of two years in, in crypto. And there, there hasn't been like quite the same narrative oomph as DeFi and, and NFTs, but they're sort of like, I view as kind of like the third major sort of tranche of, I'll give credit to like Ethereum innovation, but not really, they're not really specific to Ethereum. It's just that's where the communities have, have grown up. You know, I, I think of DAOs as basically like communities, like 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 forum communities, but with a bank account and like a shared balance sheet. Like like you're all you're all like friends, but you're also all shareholders of this club. And your goal is to like make the club a financial success. Um, and that's that's like really elegantly simple. Like it's it's uh, you know like we'll we'll give you you know we'll give you tokens in the club uh, for helping us build the website. We'll give you tokens in the club for helping us you know like get new users and. You know, or for building, for, for developing features. Like all of that is like, there's like some really great simplicity. And, you know, we, we definitely like, like there's been this, like the internet has been really great at sort of 
forging community. Like that's been like, like communities have been just kind of like forged and, and like there's like the people come together and they fragment into groups. They come together and they fragment into groups. And like those groups now with kind of the, the, the emergence of blockchain and stablecoin, like now have like real economic viability. Um, and the same, and, and they have economic identity, I guess. And so I, for us, I think DAOs are a huge, like are a huge opportunity. Um, you know, I think that like Uphold has kind of like, you know, like we, we, we talk a lot about like the B2C side of Uphold um, and like we as a company, like it's a big part of the business, but like a big part of Uphold's identity is actually really kind of like the B2B2C business. Like we, we power Brave, like we work with Mythical to power their ecosystem. Like we, we are quite happy to be kind of like a, a facilitator for other people to build a business. And DAOs are kind of like a big example of like another use case for a platform like Uphold. Like you have a group of people, you're building a product, you want access to banking, you want access to traditional finance, you have stable coins or whatever, but it, you, you, you want a card. And so you, want, you might want your club to have a debit card that's branded and you might want to you know, eventually be able to, to move money across across borders and into the regulated uh, <laughs> less less fun world. But and, but but I promise like you'd rather partner with with you know like someone like us or you know like or, or there, there's other other good players in the space too than go get regulated yourself. <laughs> and so like if the option is to go get regulated yourself or or partner like you will partner. And I think that that in a world where there's lots and lots of like you know like these empowered economic groups um, it's it's really great for platforms like us to sort of like like one there's the market opportunity but two like it it sort of like it challenges us to um, like you know to be more innovative and to like like really be on top of like what people are actually out there using crypto to do um, and I guess a good reason for people to partner with Uphold as opposed to I don't know something else in the emerging decentralized swap environment, right? Somebody else um, is because you they you do have access to that uh, like quote unquote less fun world that, you know, we all have to interact with. That's the real world, right? <laughs> For sure. And, and, you know, like the, the, the thing is like, I, I think that we we take digs at, at banking and the card processors because like they, they aren't, they don't feel as like hip and with it as as like the the crypto you know like i don't know the, the 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 hardcore crypto folks but i think that like what we're starting to see is like the appetite for innovation in in traditional finance starting to really kind of pick up and so it, it may be that the the like the difference from one side of the wall to the other might not be as broad uh I, I would I would guess in the next you know in the next year or so I think that like both both Visa and Mastercard have sort of made their intentions clear with with doing something in stable coins and I, you know like we're, we're going to see more of of kind of you know like that those sorts of products hit 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 the market I I, I you know like we're not doing anything specifically in DeFi that's linked to our card but we certainly think about it <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> to see like you know like you know, smart contracts that are linked to debit cards and stuff like that. You know, like it's not crazy that we'll start to see that sort of stuff touch the market in the next, my, my guess is, you know, year. Um, and and so the the divide will close, you know, you know in terms of, you know, like staying 100% on the on the DeFi side of the wall and just using, you know, your your DeFi one inches and pair of swaps and stuff like that for all of your trading. That, you know, like, that could that could be a reality, but we've we've kind of like we we're starting to walk a path in in kind of crypto where that's actually like becoming harder, not easier. Like you know, Ethereum is kind of like because it's so expensive. We have you know Polygon and Matic and Optimism and Arbitrum, and like we have we have crazy fragmentation of liquidity, and we don't really yet have the ability to like cross chain swap efficiently. Like there's designs out there that people have, maybe that will work. Um, but then like, that's like, that's just even inside the Ethereum kingdom, you still got XRP and Bitcoin and, you know, Helium and all these other assets on other chains. And so, you know, like, is there going to be a decentralized way of linking all this liquidity? Like, I mean, I hope that would be great, <laughs> but it doesn't feel super close. And so, um, you know, like in the, in the same way that, that you sort of have 
implicit trust in some of the DeFi designs, it, it might not be that much more trust to underwrite to just, you know, underwrite some trust to a centralized platform like, like an Uphold um, to, you know, temporarily, you know, move your asset to Uphold, trade to a block, to, to an asset on a completely different ledger. And if you want to self custody, you know, pull it back to your wallet. Um, and so I, I think that like, that's, you know, like, again, that's kind of like being a bridge, like being a bridge between traditional and, and crypto, and then being a bridge between all these different blockchains that, that are not yet interoperable. Yeah, it might be, and it might be entirely possible, correct, that yeah, it's not possible to do everything completely decentralized. I know that there are some people that are working on it, but um, I don't know any, of any other technology that doesn't at some point come down to a single point of failure, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I like, you know, like we, like there's Ren and there's ThorSwap and there's like, you know, like there's, there's definitely, there's definitely teams that are out there, but there's a part of me that's like the rate of, the rate of like new blockchain development is so high where like, even if you support BTC and ETH and XRP and a few of the major coins and you, you build like this pretty good decentralized way to swap them so you, so you don't need, you know, centralized middlemen, you know, like they'll in that time be five or 10 new blockchains that won't be part of that aggregator and, and until like I, I don't think that like the the rate of innovation is not really slowing down and so it's hard to like really even perceive it's hard for me to really perceive of like how you would build you know like designs that are future proof when when there's just so much it's like so so much innovation um yeah, let's branch off into maybe some of that the the newer innovations in the in the space. Well, like uh, NFTs. Why are NFTs important? And maybe how is Uphold? I know we talked at the beginning a little bit about um, Mythical. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about um, Uphold's interaction with NFTs and what you personally see as the future. I think that that you know we we believe uh, a lot. We, we believe very strongly in like in the application of NFTs to, to gaming. Um, we think that that's like such a great use case that you've got, like you've always had these like, you know, rare items and in and, and, and games and there's always been markets for in-game items. They've just been like fragmented and crazy, like on eBay or like these private sites for trading items. And so like, like the, the market like demand is so clearly there and NFTs are, just so clearly a better solution than the chaos of a bunch of like shoddy websites. I mean, I, I, I you know, and like, you know, like I, 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 I was a World of Warcraft player back in the day. And I remember like, you know, like all of like, you know, like all of the like, you know, famous players, like, or the big name players, like, you know, they would sell their accounts or they would, you know, like they would power level run people through to sell rare items. And like, there's just like, there definitely is an economy there that is underserved. And NFTs feel like such a logical extension of a lot of the blockchain tech um, that, that, that we play with. So, so that, definitely like gaming is a big part of our strategy. And we were really excited to work with Mythical because I think, you know, we, like we, we list a bunch of other NFT gaming related assets on the platform. We, we believe, you know, very strongly that those projects will eventually, um, you know, develop like great products and, 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 and find good, good, like, like, there's like, I'll, I'll get like, the, to be more specific, like Axies has, you know, like, I think version one of Axies Infinity, like, there was a lot of hype, uh, like, there's a lot of token hype and, 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 you know, like, around, like, specifically the gamification that would, like, drive value to the token. And there was less about, like, the actual gameplay, but they've really kind of, like, now that they've, you know, made a bajillion dollars, uh, from the token, like now they've really sort of like really, you know, invested in gameplay and making it more engaging and like really, but like mythical comes from like, you know, like the like first class gaming world. And it's like, instead of, instead of like having these games that are like really designed specifically for the gamification and token, like the token mechanics, like, I guess like in a lot of these games, like the token mechanics, like define the game and what interests us are like the games that are really like, you know, a class games uh, that just happen to have items. And those could be, you know, those could be, you know, like flow, flow back into sort of like the, the blockchain space. You know, in the, in the world that like I see in, in gaming, like, like, you know, fast forward a little bit more, you know, Uphold can power all of the transactions 
you know, for your game. Like we can, we, instead of you building a marketplace, you know, in your auction house or whatever you want to track items and things inside the game, like we can do that. Like that's exactly what we do. Like we have, you know, like we, we run a high performance ledger system with pricing and all the other things. And like, we can do that very well. And so like for, for games, like we can, we can take a lot of that lift off, off the studio shoulders and, and be kind of like a ledger for items and tracking items. And then we can also sort of like bring those items out into the, into the DeFi world by making NFTs of them and, and, you know, making them available for trade out on marketplaces. I, I think that like the next level of iteration there is games might decide that they don't even want to build some of these features purely centralized. They would maybe lean on DeFi marketplaces for items in their game. And so you can imagine like going to your auction house in World of Warcraft and it's like pointing to a decentralized platform where like people that don't even play the game are like market making in the in-game items. And it's like, oh, I want to borrow that sword. I borrowed it from this guy that has no idea what the sword does or what the game does. But like, you know, they're, they're just there to make a buck. Uh, but you as a player of the game are getting access to like all of this liquidity. You're not just waiting for like one of the 12 players who has, you know, I don't know, the, the, the ore that you're looking for to put it up on the auction house. So like, I think that like, Gaming is like, it's just so ripe for, for like a lot of this technology being killer. I think that, you know, NFTs, like why are they so broadly like becoming like so exciting for people? I think NFTs speak to a market segment that never really was that interested in some of the kind of like, just kind of like pure speculation on, on you know, the, the, the last few generations of, of crypto. Um, you know, like, I think that, you know, if you, if you follow, like, and, and it's, it's like, I, I tell people that like DeFi is like too big to talk about, like, like as if it's a thing, like there's like so many clicks and communities and parts of DeFi where it's like, I, I don't even know where to begin. Like NFTs are really like, they're, they're becoming that way as well. You know, like you, you'll know your specific little corner of NFTs. And so there's like, all of the PFPs and punks and crypto funks and apes and all of that stuff, like all of that space. And then even like that space is like, you know, like it's, it's rich space. Like there's like all kinds of like playful creativity and memes and like, you know, the very kind of like, it's kind of like very pure crypto. I would say like, it's very like quintessential crypto. It's just memes and, 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 and fun. And, and, you know, what motivates people there is, is, you know, like, like there, there's definitely like some you know like belief that um part of its identity and like tribalism that like people want the, to be part of the tribe the ten thousand people that have it and they want that badge of honor definitely there's some speculation you know like like nfts are like even more volatile than most tokens like uh you, know, you can buy an nft for one eth and then tomorrow it's 10 ETH. like that's not going to happen to you in 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 normal assets and so there's definitely some you know like I had a friend who bought an ape, you know, when it first came out, stories that, that keep people interested. And I'm sure that there's like, the regulators don't love that side of the NFT space. Um, but, but there's like other parts of NFTs. There's like art blocks. And there's like all this like generative art. And there's like a lot of people that are just like, you know, like it, it really is a new medium. I, that's like kind of cheesy, but like, you know, like, you know, like the projects and I can't remember the name of the, the projects on my head, but like, you know, there's, there's, there's a bunch of these where like, depending on who has owned the artwork, like the address, like the art changes as, as, the, as the ownership changes, like the address morphs the artwork over time slightly. And there's like all kinds of stuff that like are basically like building on blockchain as a medium. And that stuff is, you know, like really, really cool. Uh, <laughs> like, like super, super cool. So I think that like NFTs like dumbed down is like there's, there's, you know, like perceived enormous upside opportunity. There's, there's like relatability to an audience that didn't really relate to, you know, pure, like pure, the pure financial market stuff in crypto. And then there's like this gaming side of, of the space where, you know, like you've got all this money and items that have been trapped in local databases that finally can live out in the open. Yeah. It's, that's the most interesting part to me is that I think, uh, you know, the, the term kind of makes people's eyes glaze over because they go, oh, what's that? But 
NFTs have always kind of existed, especially the gamers. When you think about, um, I'm not quite sure because I'm not a WoW player, but um, I played CS:GO or CS. Um, yeah, so all of the skins there, they're all NFTs basically, but they just reside on Steam servers, right? So yeah, yeah, and they're trapped there. You know, like you know, uh, you know, like like this is still a small part of of DeFi, but like you know, you can own a crypto punk, and there's platforms where you can borrow money to crypto punk because it's proof. It's, it's on chain that you own it. It's composable. Like you know, like you can get you know sometimes you get airdrops for just owning the NFT. You know, you could have. You can have logins to private communities because you own the NFT. And like everyone, like, I think that, you know, like, and we, you know, like we are, you know, like, like, it's hard to like, it's hard to say if like we're a centralized platform, but we're like, we're like an 85% centralized platform with like, you know, some fringe things in, in, in the DeFi world. But like we, you know, and I, I think all the centralized platforms, like you look at all of the creativity and like people building on Ethereum and you, you have to either be like, uh, like scared because <laughs> it's like it's like man like like there's like like hundreds of thousands of people building new applications that all talk to this stuff all the time like how are we ever going to compete with launching that many features on our centralized application and steam should feel the same way you know like if you're a game company and you're like trying to come like trying to compete with DeFi and and like the it's going to become like ridiculous at some point <laughs> it's going to become like really really hard to compete against the amount of like just creative people that are banging their heads at the against the problem and like we're all you know like again like there's scalability and other problems still but but the, just the amount of like stuff that you can do when you all agree on a single source of truth which is like we you know a common ledger and like a single you know like a, a single set of like you know rules for how how things interact like that that's just really powerful yeah, I guess the exciting part is we're really going to find out how true it is about that that uh, monkeys on a typewriter metaphor, right? Um, I, the most exciting part to me personally is that fact that you could, hey, go from I'm going to sell my dragon lore to uh, in five seconds, I now have it on a credit card. So that was the most exciting part for me. I don't know about anybody out there, but um, Maybe you could talk a little bit more about Uphold's credit card and why y'all like to push it a little bit more before we uh, before we start to head out. Yeah, I, I think that the you know like one of the, the another metaphor for 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 cards is kind of you know like you can um, uh, the metals that we support on the platform are physical metals, um, which is a little bit a little bit different than than on some places where you trade like purely financial metals that like you can't you can't get access to the metals like you can request delivery of, of your of your gold on uphold um and i don't i'm trying to remember exactly which region to support them but there definitely are i think in, in europe and the us will we'll facilitate delivery of gold um you wouldn't actually want to do that probably like it's very rare that people actually want delivery of of precious metals it's 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 a cumbersome kind of pain in the ass process but you know that you could like you always know that if you have metals on our platform if you really needed to you can you could get them and so a card you know, you might not want to spend your crypto. And, and again, like not, not just for the tax reasons, like there's also kind of like the obvious reason, which is like, I just, I just went through the effort of buying this stuff. Like, why would I, why would I want to spend it necessarily? <laughs> like, I, you know, it's like, it's like I started with dollars. I bought a bunch of crypto. And now I want to go back to dollars to spend it. Like I could have just saved myself a step and not done that. And so, but, but like, you know, that you could, right? Like, so like you can invest in something and you know that you have real time liquid access if you need it. In that asset, um, I think that that's that's like a, a big part of the use case in in places where you know you have a developed banking and, and credit system, where you, you have other you have other cards in your wallet, you have other things you could use. The uphold card is kind of like a nice option to have. It's there if you need it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Josh Greenwald, Chief Risk Officer at Uphold, um, the Anything to Anything uh, trade platform. Uh, they've got some big stuff coming out with their credit cards, so we'll keep it tuned. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming out, Mr. Greenwald. Perfect. Thanks so much for having me, Miguel. It's great.